Okay. Um, yes, so the original talk was something like vision during unconsciousness. I'm going to talk a bit about vision during unconsciousness, but I, I thought I would broaden the scope a bit uh, and talk about generally what my lab does. Um, I know a lot of people have said as kind of a disclaimer that they don't really study consciousness. And um, I, I really, really don't study consciousness. <laughs> Almost to, to a... <laughs> you don't study more consciousness than these guys. I'm barely conscious. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm here, but what, what we study is, is vision and what happens when you see. And of course, that's, that's a very big part of consciousness. But uh, we're more on the end of, of asking, how, how is it that the brain of, of the monkey in our lab or, or, or the human can extract important quantities from the visual input that it gets from the retina. And we ask this in a very mathematical way. What we'd, what we'd like to come up with would be an algorithm that captures the way in which the system transforms a retinal input into a spiking output that contains information about something like the velocity of a moving stimulus uh, or the identity of an object that you might be looking at. And of course, this question is intimately involved with consciousness. It's probably something that's necessary for consciousness, but it's not sufficient uh, for one to have something like a feeling about what one is seeing or, or, or even an emotion. It's, it's more about uh, uh, extracting information um, in an algorithmic way from, from uh, um, an ensemble of signals. So uh, with that, I'll dive into uh, a variation of a diagram that we've probably seen several times now. This is the monkey visual uh, cortex, or at least part of it. Um, and as other people have said in various ways, uh, there are many, many areas that are dedicated to vision in the monkey brain. Uh, the, the largest and probably most important is the primary visual cortex area V1. And from V1, we can trace at least two pathways that are kind of uh, broadly termed uh, a temporal pathway and a parietal pathway, which are involved, again, broadly speaking, in the recognition of objects for the former and things to do with motion and spatial orientation uh, for the latter. So uh, this gives you a bit of a feeling for the anatomy. If you were to take this out and lay it as a circuit diagram, there are many possible circuit diagrams. Uh, you've seen several of them. This was one that I found on the McGill webpage, and I kind of like it. Um, they all convey the same point, and that is that coming out of the retina, you have many, many different uh, areas that uh, involve different uh, lobes of the brain, the parietal, the temporal, the occipital. Um, the things to notice here are that you have lots and lots of areas that all essentially depend almost entirely on V1 to learn anything about what's going on in the world. And these are the extra striate um, areas of the primate brain. So the first question that one might ask is, given that uh, these areas out here can't know anything about the visual world that doesn't first come through MT, uh, sorry, V1, uh, what do you need all these areas for? In other words, they're, they're just reanalyzing information that must first pass through V1 and indeed through the LGN and the retina as well. So you have at least, at last count, 25, 30 different areas just dedicated to processing the information that passes through V1. As you've heard from Julio Martinez and from Eric Cook and from others, probably the best uh, studied example of a transformation from the striate to the extra striate cortex is from V1 to MT. MT, as you now know very well, is an area that's involved in processing motion signals. It's intimately involved with the animal's uh, behavior with respect to, to motion, its perception of motion, its control of eye movements, limb movements, etc. Um, so in MT, uh, you find neurons that are very selective for motion direction. But of course, you also find neurons in V1 that are very selective for motion direction. In fact, it's almost certainly the case that the neurons that project from V1 to MT are themselves direction selective. So one might ask, why do you need MT if you already have direction selectivity in V1? And I'll talk now about some work that I did uh, over 10 years ago when I was a postdoc with Rick Bourne. And starting from the very simple question of what do you see when you see this thing moving, uh, the answer, hopefully, for all of you is that you see a kind of a diamond moving purely horizontally left and right uh, across the screen. So uh, this is an important thing to be able to see, obviously, if it were a predator or a prey or, or, or something like that. We need to know exactly which direction it's moving in. And we can ask what would happen if we were a V1 neuron. The thing that 
everyone recognizes about V1 neurons is that they have very, very small receptive fields. One neuron might be able to see uh, a view of the world that is essentially the size of a dime held at arm's length, so about one degree of visual angle, or in, in some cases, much, much less. So if you had this tiny, tiny view of the world and you were a direction-selective V1 neuron and your job was to report to the rest of the brain, areas MT and everything else, which direction is this diamond moving in, you can see immediately that you're going to get the wrong answer. Uh, now, because of this impoverished view, you've come to the conclusion that this edge is moving with a, with a vertical component. It's, it actually looks like it's going up and to the right rather than purely horizontal, which is, as you already know, the answer. This is entirely a property of the geometry of the configuration. It has to do with uh, what's measurable within a very, very small aperture and the orientation of the edge itself. It has nothing per se to do with the brain, but it's, a, it's an actual fundamental limitation on V1 and its ability to signal motion. So if we go back to our diagram here, this problem that I just described has been known about for uh, uh, almost a century. Um, and other people have studied it in the brain, but we, we had a different take on it, and we wanted to record from MT neurons in an awake monkey who was just sort of looking at the screen. So this is what uh, Julio would have called zombie mode, I guess. There's, there's no behavior here. He's just sort of looking at the screen. And we're placing a stimulus like the one I just showed you in the receptive field of, of, uh, of each neuron. And the question is, simply, does the neuron encode what a V1 neuron might see, which is the wrong answer, which involves a vertical component to the motion, or does it get the right answer? So the reason we think it might get the right answer is that each MT neuron has a much, much bigger receptive field. It can see lots of stuff on the screen, and it gets that by integrating the outputs of lots and lots of V1 neurons that are tiled across space. So when you do this experiment, uh, you get a very clear answer. This is uh, a quick summary of a population response. But on the x-axis here, I have time, <coughs> time from when the stimulus starts moving. And on the y-axis, I essentially have a measure of the error of the MT population response. How much does it actually encode the correct direction, with the correct direction being 0, purely horizontal? And you see the very early responses are way off. They're off by about 30 degrees, and they're off in a direction that's exactly predictable from the orientation of the edge of the stimulus and from the geometry of a V1 neuron that would provide input to MT. So you see this very early error, which is eventually corrected within about 100 milliseconds, and the corrected response persists for the duration of the stimulus. Once it gets the right answer, it maintains it. If we look at a different edge of the stimulus so that the, the, the edge is moving in the same direction horizontally but simply oriented in a different way, you get a very nice kind of, <clears throat> kind of symmetrical answer where the initial response is wrong, but now it's pointing in a different direction, and it eventually corrects itself. And you can see there's a small residual error in both cases of about 5 degrees. Okay. So this supports the idea that MT, at least if you're willing to wait a few tens of milliseconds, is the area that gives you the right answer, that tells you within a few degrees which direction something is moving, and in motion being kind of a primal aspect of... of um, of uh, vision, this is an important thing to, to have in your brain. <clears throat> then we did a sort of strange experiment. We took the same animals, recorded from the same neurons using the same stimuli, or at least I should say the same populations of neurons using the same stimuli. And we can plot out the same answer, and it's very different. Uh, you again have an early response which is wrong by 20 or so degrees, and it never gets corrected for as long as the stimulus is on. You can do that for the opposite direction, too. So this is certainly some kind of manipulation of consciousness. It's anesthesia, so you're also manipulating lots of other things that you don't really understand very well. But it gives you the idea that there's something about the way that these neurons integrate, um, in this case, motion signals, that uh, changes when you um, introduce unconsciousness. And I should say that these, these results uh, do indicate a very specific kind of change in the way the system is working. So it's not the case that the neurons just stopped firing, because what we're measuring here is a measure of direction selectivity. So neurons are very direction selective. In fact, um, in many cases, more direction selective than when the animals were awake. It's just that they're signaling the wrong direction. They're signaling the very local direction that you get by measuring just one edge of the stimulus. <clears throat> and uh, as I say, this persists, this persists for the duration of the stimulus, so it's not a transient event.
So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about how is it that the brain integrates different types of signals. How do these extra striate areas integrate um, signals that they get from V1 and from lower level areas to produce estimates of things that are important for, for survival and, and for vision? Uh, and I'm not going to just talk about area MT, talk about lots of extra striate areas, because it, it, it is generally the case that what's, what goes on in MT is also something that, that should be happening in other, in other extra striate areas. There are lots of areas that essentially have the job of integrating output that's ultimately from V1 and, and, and from the retina. If you look down here in the temporal stream in area IT or TEO, you find cells that respond very specifically to faces. This is one that responds only to a picture of uh, O.J. Simpson. Um, and this is, you know, this is my favorite example of all time. It's probably not uh, illustrative of most IT cells. Most IT cells are not that specific, and they're certainly not tuned for OJ, one would hope. But they have a way of integrating their inputs so that they can provide estimates, they can provide information about what's out there in a way that simply wouldn't happen in V1. So in V1, you might find that cells were very interested in, say, a vertical orientation as it occurs here, but you'd find a vertical orientation here or here. And any one of these types of stimuli could presumably drive the cell. Likewise, you could find eyes or noses or, or you know, specific shades of gray. It's something about a high-level combination of features that's really necessary to trigger the output of this neuron. And if we could figure out what the relationship was between the inputs that we provide to the animal and the outputs that we measure, we would understand how the brain computes things like face selectivity or motion selectivity. Another area that is of great interest, uh, especially from a theoretical point of view, is area MST. MST gets its input from MT, which gets its input from V1. And this is very much sort of like the O.J. Simpson cell of the dorsal visual pathway. It's not nearly as glamorous in the sense that it doesn't pop out at you as being selected for something very interesting. But it is quite interesting, and, and it's um, something that I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about in the talk. Uh, the selectivity here is for motion patterns, but we're not talking anymore about motion just moving in a straight line. We're talking about very complex patterns where you see things rotating around in circles, looming towards you so that they're expanding, combinations of those two, so you see spirals of things that are moving. You can see um, very, very complex patterns. And again, you have the property, which I think is the most important property, which is that uh, this neuron, the single neuron in MST, won't respond to any of the components, any of the individual components of the stimulus, which is its preferred stimulus, which is clockwise rotation of all the elements on the screen in a circle. It won't respond to counterclockwise rotation, and it won't respond to any of the elements of rotation, i.e. motion in a straight line or even pairs of motions in a straight line. So this is not behavior that you would find in MT. It suddenly appears in MST. You certainly wouldn't find it in V1. So the questions I'm going to ask in this talk, there are three questions. Uh, one is, can we determine the mechanisms by which MST neurons integrate their inputs to produce their outputs? Why MST? Well, MST is a very challenging thing to understand. It's many, many synapses away from the retina. It's at the very highest level of the dorsal visual hierarchy. We don't have good mathematical models of it until we have a good mathematical model of MST. We, don't, we can't really say with any confidence that we understand how uh, these sort of motion responses are computed. And hence, we can't really say what the area is doing. So I'm going to talk quite a bit about area MST. And I'm going to, after that, ask if we can get a mathematical model of MST, does it generalize to the rest of the extra strike cortex? And this bears on what I think is a really uh, important question in studying the visual system and in, in sensory systems in general, and that is, is every little one of these areas in the extra striate cortex uh, a sort of different entity? Is the brain just a bag of tricks where it solves lots and lots of different problems in completely different ways? Or are there core principles we can uh, extract that apply uh, to each area, and so that once we've gotten a really good understanding of one area, we understand all of them. Obviously, that's what we would like to be the case. And then the third question I'm going to address is, are these computational concepts the keys to understanding consciousness? So to foreshadow a bit, the answer is uh, yes, and yes, and uh, no. And or at least 
I really doubt it. But uh, I encourage people to hang in there anyway because, as I say, I'm not a consciousness person, so maybe people will find a way to sort of put all this together, and that would be an interesting uh, point for discussion. And I will return at the very, very end of the talk to how this could conceivably relate to consciousness, but I'm going to spend most of my time on question one and uh, most of the rest on question two. Okay. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned in the first few slides, there are lots of different kinds of motion that one could be interested in. And motion, uh, as I've said several times, is sort of one of the most important interfaces that you have with the world. You know where things are going, when they're approaching you, when they're running away, and so forth. And we can divide these on essentially mathematical grounds into translation, which is just motion in a straight line, which is what I talked about in the context of MT. Uh, rotation, which is obviously rotation. Uh, expansion, which is probably the most primal uh, stimulus you can imagine. Something that's moving towards you and getting bigger and bigger is really uh, the one thing that will light up a lot of your dorsal visual pathway and uh, initiate interesting behaviors. So these are different kinds of optic flow. And now what I'm going to show you is the first bit of data uh, from my lab where we recorded from individual MST neurons in a monkey who is uh, kind of just staring at the screen. There's no behavior here. And we want to know what is it that makes an MST neuron fire? What sort of stimulus uh, is necessary? And because these neurons are really complicated, I'm going to show you a lot of different kinds of data, and I'm going to try and make it as simple as possible. But if you get lost or if you have questions, uh, please interrupt. So this is kind of a standard tuning curve that you've seen before. This tells you that if I move a stimulus in different directions, I get different responses. And the best response is when the stimulus moves down. And this is translation motion, nothing fancy. Stimulus moves down, the neuron fires. Now, to facilitate uh, the processing of lots of data, I'm going to show you this as a color-coded map. This is the same tuning curve now in color. So uh, red means lots of spikes, blue means none. So again, the neuron responds most when the, when the stimulus moves down. So the next question you can ask is, what happens if you move the stimulus around in the visual field? In other words, where is the receptive field of this neuron? So for translation, this is no big surprise. You have a very large receptive field uh, in MST. This is not like V1, where things are tiny, tiny. Uh, you'll find that you get the same preference for downward motion almost anywhere in the lower visual field within a range of about 30 degrees by 15 degrees. Um, this is quite typical of, of area MST. Okay. So this is, aside from the large receptive field, not very different from what you would find in V1 or MT. The cell is direction selective, and it has a certain circumscribed receptive field. Now, the important thing, the most important thing for understanding MST is what I call spirals. These are the combinations of patterns that are either moving towards you and hence expanding, or are rotating around like in the original MST slide that I showed you. And you can define a, face, a, a, a space of spirals that's um, analogous to this tuning curve, where as we go around this circle, the rightward point here would be pure expansion, a stimulus moving towards you and getting bigger and bigger. And then the polar opposite of that on the left side would be contraction, as if it's moving farther away. Upwards would be counterclockwise rotation. Downwards here would be clockwise rotation. And as we go around, we explore everything in between. So something that's moving towards you while it's rotating will look like a spiral moving towards you, or a sort of swirling spiral pattern. Right? Is that clear? So we basically tested all these neurons with all these different spiral stimuli in all these different positions of the visual field. And this is one neuron. This is still all the responses of one neuron. And what this neuron does is it tells you when something is moving towards you, because it has a response to expansion that is essentially invariant with position in the, in the, in the visual field. So anytime something is approaching you rapidly, this neuron will start firing. Obviously a useful thing to have. <clears throat> and there are quite a few neurons like this in area MST, as I'll show you. Uh, we also tested a third class of stimuli, which I won't describe too much. These are called deformation. We can, again, define a space of possible stimuli and, and record the responses. The reason we include all three is purely mathematical. The three different types of stimuli form a basis for all linear optic flow. So in other words, you can make any optic flow stimulus you can imagine out of, out of linear combinations of translation, spirals, and deformation. In other words, this is every possible stimulus within the space of motion. 
So our goal uh, as experimentalists and as theorists now is to produce a model that takes as input the stimulus that we show the monkey and produces this as an output. This is actually a very hard thing to do. A lot of people have tried to do this uh, with varying success. So I'm going to tell you in some technical detail how we do this. And um, I'll first say that uh, these stimuli here, or, uh, the responses to these stimuli, there's a total of about 200 and something, 216 stimuli there. Um, that seems like a lot of stimuli, but it's actually nowhere near enough to solve the kind of modeling problem that we're trying to solve here. And, and I'll show you why in a second. But in order to solve this problem, we needed to test many, many, many different kinds of stimuli with each neuron. And to that end, we developed a new stimulus, which I'll attempt to show you, which I will not succeed in. But I have a backup plan, and that is YouTube. For some reason, my student decided to post the stimulus on YouTube. Why anyone would want to look at this, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's something you can look at while you're smoking marijuana or something. <laughs> you can see it's had 99 views. That's pretty good. <laughs> there you go. Well, some of us, anyway. <laughs> okay, so here's the stimulus. The goal is to explore the space of all possible motion stimuli as quickly as possible. So YouTube will show this to us now, and if, if you watch the stimulus, what you'll see is, um, ah, okay. So what you should see, if you look carefully, is every once in a while it'll be an expansion stimulus, sometimes it'll rotate, sometimes it'll have translation. And the point is it's going through these stimuli very, very, very quickly. The idea being you can now explore a huge space of possible stimuli, which you couldn't do in the conventional approach to, uh, to vision. Okay? Thank you, YouTube. So now, having done that, we have an enormous range of stimuli that we've tested. We have the output of each neuron that we've recorded all this time that the animal is looking at this uh, stimulus. And, and now we're really in a good position to answer the question, what model takes this as input and produces the spike train as output. Very simple. So the model, the first model that we tried is a very, very standard kind of a model. It's one that in its form can't possibly be wrong. Uh, it could be incomplete. I mean, it's certainly incomplete, but it can't possibly be wrong. And that is basically that the, uh, the cell you're recording from gets input uh, from the stimulus and, well, it it receives input indirectly from the stimulus via some subunits, which we construe to be MT, because we know that MT provides input to MST. So, then, so rather than trying to figure out the relationship between the stimulus itself and the MST output, we ask, what is the relationship between an estimate of the MT output and the MST output? All right? Because, of course, MST has no access to the visual stimulus. It only knows what MT tells it, so it's going to try and do its computations on these outputs. Now, of course, we're not going to record from every neuron in MT in addition to the one MST neuron we're interested in. Uh, we're going to develop a model of how MT should respond to this stimulus. And uh, as luck would have it, MT is probably the most thoroughly studied chunk of cortex in the history of the universe. So we essentially know an awful lot about MT, and we, we have very good basis for constraining such a model. So our MST cell, we imagine, has the choice of any MT inputs that it wants. It sums them up, and it puts them through a simple nonlinearity to produce the firing rate. The nonlinearity just basically says the output can't be a negative number because we're talking about spike rates, and that once you increase the input, the output goes up accordingly. Here are some more kind of hairy details, which I won't get into, but if anybody has a real interest in this topic, uh, I encourage you to discuss it with me or maybe even join my lab because this is essentially a very, very hard optimization problem that we, um, we bring in a lot of tools from, from machine learning to try to solve, and I think we've done a pretty good job, but I think there's always, um, there's always room for improvement there. So rather than go through all that, I'll, I'll just draw this as kind of a picture. So let's imagine that the MST cell wants to respond to some kind of stimulus, and it has access to all the MT uh, units that exist that have different receptive field sizes, preferred directions, preferred speeds, et cetera, and it's just going to form connections with them in the way that you would do in a standard kind of, kind of neural network approach. The other technical detail that I'll mention is that we're fitting this with cross-validation, which is very, very important. 
Cross-validation means that you fit the model on a, on a subset of the data and then test it on another subset. The advantage of that is it prevents you from fooling yourself. Uh, what this modeling approach will do is it'll, it'll just very happily keep adding MT subunits into the model forever and ever because it'll get marginally better and better fits. Cross-validation protects you against that because if you're adding lots and lots of subunits just to fit one chunk of data, it won't successfully predict the responses to the other data, the other inputs, unless it's a, a really essential part of, of the model. Okay? So the upshot of this is that we can be confident that the models that we get back are realistic in the sense that they use realistic estimates of the MT output and that they're kind of parsimonious, that they're using the minimal number of subunits that they need to fit the data. Of course, what this really is is a giant Hubel weasel kind of uh, expedition into essentially taking the very intuitive idea that you can record from a neuron that has certain output properties which aren't present in the input but you know the properties of the neurons that provide input to the neuron you're recording from. And the question is just how do you arrange all these inputs to get your output? It's just like Hubel and Weasel did intuitively in V1. Okay, so the upshot is we've got now our new super fancy stimulus. We hired, I got lots of really smart uh, mathematicians in the lab to try and fit these models and solve this problem. And the result is uh, that it, um, it doesn't work at all. So uh, here's the data. And as I said, our goal would be to produce a model that essentially perfectly reproduces this data. And here's the output of the model after all the training and, and everything we could possibly think of to try. And you see that uh, it reproduces the responses to translation. It is, in fact, tuned for downwards motion over most of the lower part of the visual field. Uh, but that's about it. It doesn't reproduce really the strength or the pattern of responses to spirals very well. It's hopeless with this deformation stimulus. Um, so that's the end of the talk. Thanks. No, 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 no. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, so in a way, I mean, in a way, not to push this too far, but this is actually kind of like what we saw in MT when we anesthetized the animal. You have essentially a very dumb response pattern which represents the very local responses that you saw from the lower level areas. They're, they're sensitive to, to low level stimulus features but they have no, this model has no intelligent way of, of, of integrating them. So, on the other hand, uh, as you now know, this is, it's kind of a dumb model. I mean, the, it's not wrong. It's true that neurons integrate their inputs but it's, it's very incomplete. And as you've heard from uh, from several speakers here, uh, the one thing we do know about neurons is that they talk to each other within, within, even within one area. There's extensive interconnections, and this, these conversations among the neurons actually do something. Uh, so our, our kind of zeroth order model of an MST cell is that it's getting input from lots of different MT cells that have certain preferred directions, but that each one is kind of an island unto itself. It just filters the input, produces an output, MST sums it up, and that's it. What if these neurons are doing something more, as we know that they are? What if there are all these properties that have been found by experimentalists over the decades are important, things like center surround organization, center surround suppression, contrast gain control, normalization, synaptic depression. All, all of these things are known to exist, but they're not factored into our uh, MT model at all at the moment. The MT, the MT cells are just simply um, standalone units. and so. For instance, the one that everyone seems to like and the one that I actually uh, preferred going into the project, uh, <coughs> the project was imagine that uh, an MT cell simply gets inhibitory input from its neighbors, which we know that is very common in MT. And intuitively, you'd say this is exactly what you need to produce the kind of selectivity we see in MST, because what does this, this organization do? It suppresses the responses to pure translation which I showed you on the previous slide, were overemphasized in the output of the model that we have. So rather than building just a model of surround suppression, we realized from, from reading the modeling literature that actually all these influences, all these kinds of things like synaptic depression, normalization, surround suppression, mathematically they're all kind of the same thing with different parameters. They're all ways to take a, a single subunit and have it interact with its neighbors with varying uh, parameters that...
um, involve the strength of the interaction, which is one parameter, but also uh, oops, the tuning of it. So in other words, you could have this one subunit getting input from neighbors that have exactly the same tuning as itself, or from very broad tuning, or with no tuning at all. And this would be an example of what's often called untuned normalization. Or you can vary the spatial extent of this input pool. So you could go from a very broad set of inputs, like we see with um, surround suppression, to something that's very, very local. And I've written here synaptic depression as an example of something like this. And it's not technically a case where the cells are getting inputs from their neighbors. It's just a case where you have um, the output of a subunit will be much, much smaller than you would predict based on its pure feed-forward sensory properties for the simple reason that when you really, really drive the subunit, it gets tired of firing, and it fires less than you would predict. Right? But the key here is that this sort of effect would be very, very local and very, very tightly tuned because it's essentially a mirror of the subunit itself. And you can have anything else in between. This is essentially a two-dimensional space that covers almost all of the models that people have talked about in the literature on nonlinear interactions uh, within, within an area. So um, because we have lots and lots of data and smart students fitting it all to models, we can just go back and refit all the models and say, take the same approach we had before, Let's let our MST cell get input from any MT cells at once, but now we'll assume that the MT cells have some kind of additional influence, and we'll let the model figure out what it wants it to be to optimize the fit to the data, but it could be anything that it wants. So when we do this, it really helps, I mean, a lot. Um, and the main reason I say that is that you suddenly now have really good tuning for uh, expansion motion. This is still this one cell, which I like quite a bit. Um, it's not perfect if you compare just by eye the fit between the, the data and the model, but it's much, much better. And it's better in the sense that you now have largely spatially invariant tuning for this kind of elaborate stimulus while preserving the selectivity for the simpler stimulus uh, that, that it had before we, we introduced this, this additional twist. So now the question is, what, what did the model come up with? How did it solve this problem? And uh, I said that um, intuitively you'd think this would be the answer, um, uh, but you would be wrong. Uh, this was the answer. So when we went back and looked at the parameters that it chose, it always came back, no matter how we ran the model, no matter how we optimized it, it always came back to saying that the, the very best thing you can do to fit the data is to have a source of suppression of the output of each subunit that is very, very local and very, very tightly tuned to the same thing as the stimulus which I, to me kind of screams out synaptic depression, but we have no uh, independent evidence of that. So across the population of the MST neurons, this was almost always the case. If we asked which size of uh, suppressive influence did you want, it almost always came back as that the model wanted it for every cell to be exactly the same size as the subunit itself. And what sort of tuning did you want? It says we want it to be very tuned, and we want it to be tuned for the same thing as the excitatory subunit, with the exception of another mode that popped up here, which we can talk about, where there was a bunch of cells that actually preferred un completely untuned um, uh, kind of modulatory influences. But um, I think these were less interesting. They tended not to be tuned for the more exotic kinds of stimuli that uh, we're interested in explaining, so I won't, I won't go into detail about those. But the upshot is that almost every neuron that we recorded from, uh, we could get a very good model for it if we uh, used the standard feed-forward approach in combination with this one additional twist, which is a very local and tightly tuned um, modulatory influence. So this kind of brings it back to Hubel and Weasel again. Hubel and Weasel had a very simple model of simple cells, and they had a simple model of complex cells. The complex cell was one that basically, again, just added up its inputs. But in order to make it work, they had to first filter it through a nonlinearity. The nonlinearity basically says, don't just add these two up because they'll kind of cancel out. If you're familiar with the Hubel and Weasel story, you know this. Uh, you need a nonlinearity that, that prevents the output of either one of these from becoming negative. 
which is commonsensical anyway. If they're real cells, you can't have a negative output. So it both makes it more kind of biologically realistic and it makes it, worth, uh, makes it work conceptually. So we thought maybe we can reduce this model, this space of possible model uh, interactions even more just down to one parameter in the way that Hubel and Weasel did. I mean, conceptually, they didn't do this mathematically. And say, well, maybe each subunit can be passed through a one parameter nonlinearity. The reason we think this will work is recall that the thing that you have to have your inhibitory influence act on is exactly the same thing that the excitatory influence acts on. So essentially, it's just changing the final output of each subunit, and that would be consistent with this compressive nonlinearity. People very often use expansive nonlinearities in their models. These are the popular energy models. And of course, a linear model is something that could conceivably work, but who knows. So now, our MST model is essentially a Hubel weasel model in which each subunit feeds into an integrator, which produces the output of the cell. And each subunit is allowed to have a nonlinearity associated with it. It could also be linear, but uh, with the one parameter, you can choose also compressive and expansive nonlinearities. And the answer is, I guess not entirely surprising based on the previous results, is that essentially all the time, uh, the best fitting model had a very compressive nonlinearity. So a saturating nonlinearity um, for every cell. And the upshot is that when you add this in, your ability to account for the data jumps up quite, quite significantly in almost every cell. So the, the cell without any, the, um, the model without any nonlinearity does kind of okay. Uh, but in just about every cell, we improve the fit of the data by adding this one parameter. And this isn't a trivial consequence of the parameter itself. <coughs> because of the cross-validation thing I mentioned, most parameters that you add don't improve the fit at all. There's nothing, there's nothing about just adding parameters that, that gives you a better model. This is a cross-validated fit, which means that it only gives you a better fit if it actually is structurally important uh, for the model to work. So having done that, uh, we now have a model that we think at least qualitatively captures the main features of the data. It's selective for the right kind of stimulus, and it's invariant with respect to changes in that stimulus. So that, that allows us to peer a little bit more deeply into how the model organizes itself. And you can see this, this example neuron that I've been showing you uh, internally has this structure. These are the, the MT subunits that we uh, find are the most important for driving the output. And so all the complexity that you see here, all of this, all, all these different responses can really be reduced to two main drivers from MT to MST that sort of one points downward and to the left, and one points downward to the right. And those are shown here as, as the arrows in red. Uh, there are other subunits that have less weight, as shown by the uh, translucency of the, of the picture. But it's really those two that, that do most of the work. Knowing that tells you a lot about what the cell is doing, but it's not enough. You have to know that they're being passed through this compressive nonlinearity. And what that does is essentially say that no matter how strongly I drive this one input, it's not going to drive the output of the neuron by itself. And same thing for this one. You need the two of them together. You need to essentially multiply them. Mathematically, you can think of this like a log, like a logarithm, right? So it's like the sum of two logs is the product. So this is just a sort of sneaky way for getting conjunction detection, the ability to respond only when you get multiple features that you're interested at the same time without having to wire up an actual dictionary of all possible feature conjunctions that the cell could be interested in, which would be very, very complicated. So just for fun, here are some other MST receptive fields. Some are very simple. They look like MT cells. Some are quite interesting to look at. They have lots and lots of excitatory and, inhi and inhibitory subunits. The uh, point of the slide is that if you were to study these cells in the conventional way, you would just say they're all expansion detectors which is in a way true, but by itself tells you nothing about how the cell works, what it computes. Because you can see that the subunit structure is completely different from one to the next. So you really need this much richer uh, stimulus set to understand how the cell transforms its inputs to its outputs. So that's kind of the summary of how we managed to get what I think is a pretty decent understanding of uh, area MST to the point where we can at least capture the main optic flow selectivity. Um, 
So in the remaining time, I'll just mention uh, we published this paper this year. Uh, there's apparently a newspaper called the Toronto Sun, which I didn't know about. I don't know. I don't know if it's a great newspaper. <laughs> I think it's probably not. Uh, but they they were nice enough to write an article about this um, about this this work. Uh, I think they kind of missed the point. But anyway, they, it, it was nice. <laughs> I, I I don't know this paper at all. Um, one of the features of the Toronto Sun is that they ha they post their articles online, and then the readers of the Toronto Sun can write in, and they can say they can write comments about the article. So this is an article about our article. So they were writing comments about our article, essentially. And so I was interested to see what the general public thinks of MST, optic flow selectivity. <laughs> and so uh, this is the first, com the first comment that was posted after the study. You can see it's, it's right down here. <laughs> so I don't know. If English isn't your first language, this means sort of like, um, I find your result trivial. <laughs> <laughs> No, it does. A good expression. Okay, so uh, how much time do I have left? Okay, good. I'm almost done. Okay, so um, anyway, the the you know that kind of made me a little insecure because I thought you know I don't know maybe <laughs> maybe wake up sheeple one 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 has a point. Uh, you know we're still only accounting for like fifty percent of the data. I mean, there's so much left that we still don't really understand about these neurons. And this, this mechanism, it boils down to something so simple that it might ac actually even be trivial. Like, is it really useful or is it just kind of obvious in a way? But then I thought, no, I thought, no, wake up, wake up sheeple 1111 is just way off. Because, you know, the, the fact is nobody does, a mu does much better than this. If you look in low-level visual areas, V1, V2, MT, they're accounting for 40, 30 sometimes 50% of the data. So we're, we're way, way farther along the pathway. We're doing just about as well. And this, this is kind of an important mechanism. It leads to very specific experimental predictions. And it leads me to the really second big question I want to address is, does this generalize to the rest of the extrastride cortex? And I know I only have a few minutes to talk about the entire rest of the extrastride cortex. But I'll show you that the answer is, is yes. So we uh, went back and repeated the experiment in MT. Now we assume that MST getting its input from MT is just like MT getting its input from V1. Same stimulus, same model, recorded a bunch of neurons. Now we assume the only difference is that the input is from, MT, is from V1 motion energy units, fit the model, and ask what sort of nonlinearity do you need to get this model to work? And the answer is, again, you always need a compressive nonlinearity in MT. So that's good. V1 to MT is doing the same thing that MT to MST is doing. So you repeat this operation all through the pathway. OK, here's a really tough one. How about V4? This has nothing to do with motion whatsoever. It's an area that's involved in shape recognition. So we had to change the stimulus a bit. We use these kind of synthetic uh, kind of geometric shapes, but we stimulate the neurons in the same way, run the model in the same way, ask about the nonlinearity in the same way. We assume that the inputs now are V1 or V2 oriented subunits and we fit the model and get the answer. What's the answer? Again, you always need a compressive nonlinearity to make it work. OK. Last question is, what about V1? V1 is the source of all this input. Uh, so let's go do the experiment again in V1. Now the stimulus is little spots, because we have tiny, tiny receptive fields. These are V1 complex cells. <coughs> so we assume, based on Hubel weaselology, that the inputs are just basically simple cells into complex cells. Ask what subunits do you need as simple cells to fit the data, and what nonlinearity. You don't get the same answer. So the answer here is that a, a linear uh, integration works just fine as long as you have a threshold in exactly the way that Hubel and Weasel envisioned. So with that, I will say that uh, the standard kind of feed-forward model put forward by Hubel and Weasel and used by everyone in the world since in various uh, mathematical forms works just fine for V1. And here's a mathematical expression of it. Uh, it doesn't work very well uh, for the extra stride cortex unless you add in one uh, little additional twist, which is an input nonlinearity, which, as far as we can tell, is essentially always a compressive nonlinearity. And I'll skip this and get to the conclusion. Uh, the upshot is that, that the extra stride cortex is, 
important for conscious perception to bring, try to bring it back to consciousness. Uh, you can't really uh, perceive faces, uh, complex motion patterns without it, and you certainly would lose a lot of the important aspects of perception, like the invariance to different conditions without it. But the models are very simple. Uh, you can use what are essentially old-fashioned feed-forward models, and they work just fine. Uh, by just fine, I mean they account for 50% of the variance, so there's certainly plenty of work to do. Uh, it could be that these issues of synchrony or, or, or long-range connections matter a lot. The nice thing about our approach is that if anyone, anyone out there has a model they think is better, you can send it to us. We'll run our data through it and give you back the answer. If, it's, if it becomes 80%, then you win. <laughs> you know, but we've tried many, 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 many different frameworks, and so far, nothing can beat the really very simple model that I've described to you. And that's the compressive nonlinearity. If you poke around in models of the visual system, you find a compressive nonlinearity all the time. So I'm not claiming to have discovered it. But often it's buried with a lot of other stuff, and it doesn't get the emphasis that I think it requires, because in our case, it appears to be both necessary and sufficient by itself to account for uh, many of the properties that, we, that intrigue us about the extra strike cortex. And in fact, it turns up uh, uh, in, in the original form that I came across it, and in the most thoroughly studied form, uh, it turns up in the locust, and in flies, and beetles. And so, I mean, if this is a talk about consciousness, I, I'm essentially telling you that the, the important features that maybe feed into consciousness to provide you with the visual experience of knowing what's out there uh, are found in almost the identical form in insects, which uh, is possibly an interesting point for discussion, certainly would tell you something about the evolution of, of, of consciousness if it were um, really true in the way that I'm imagining, and maybe that'll come up later. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the last point that I made. So I'll just um, mention that most of this work was done by Patrick Minot, who is also uh, unfortunately graduating, looking for a postdoc. It's part of a, lar a, a, a larger collaboration with Dan Butts, um, who's a really great computational guy in Maryland. The recordings for MST, V4, and MT were done by these guys, and there's the funding. Thanks. Thanks.